Welcome to the Capital Coffee Connection. I'm Liz Hirshnoff-Tolley, and I am very excited because on this podcast, we talk about the heart and the humanity of our elected leaders. And today I have an exceptional person, a leader that I have great respect for, and he is the leader of the House Republicans, and his name is Steve Scalise, and he is from Louisiana. He's been a congressman from Louisiana since 2008, and he has done an array of other things before that. But what we're here to talk about is his heart and his humanity. And so I want to say welcome, and I want to say thank you for joining me. Well, thanks so much for having me. I appreciate it. And, you know, I just want to reflect back for a moment and say that we did meet after October 7th. And I want to say thank you because it was a really tough time for me and for our family because my niece was murdered by Hamas terrorists on October 7th. And then her daughter, a three-year-old, Abigail, was kidnapped. And I remember sitting in your office very shortly after and being able to talk to you about our hostage situation and what happened in Israel. And not only did you commit to obviously and still are committed to bringing back these hostages, but you understood the pain. And I remember looking up at the mantle above where we were sitting. There was a beautiful picture of your family. And I just thought to myself, I'm not only talking to the leader, but I'm also talking to a father. And that's really what this podcast is about, which is talking about the people behind these amazing titles, these national leaders. So I just want to say thank you. And and that meant a lot to me. And I appreciate your time today. Well, thanks. And and I remember that that meeting. It was was a difficult meeting because, you know, we we all followed what happened on October 7th. And it was just horrible to hear the stories, the barbarism. I mean, the brutality, sheer terrorism involved with what Hamas did when they invaded Israel and, and just, just went out and, and randomly killed people and started torturing people, beheading young kids, and then ultimately taking hostages, as you talked about, and and then meeting with a number of the family members who are still being held hostage. Yes. And, you know, we, we've we been committed for so long to supporting Israel, and it's 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 so important that not only as, as a great ally of the United States, but as as the only elected democracy, as, you know, as, as the importance of having a Jewish state that goes back to 1948 when America was right there from the very beginning of the formation that we we stand by. And unfortunately, there have always been threats to is, Israel's sovereignty. And, and we saw that on October 7th. And that war still goes on. There are still hostages held today. And so the battle is not over. And, and we need to be there for our friends. We need to be there for those families. And, you know, as you pointed out, as a father of two young kids, I mean, you know, that this is real. And, and when you meet the family members, it's their family members that yeah. they're still grieving for. And hopefully their family members are still alive and they can see them again one day. And uh, we need to give them all the tools that they need to make that day happen. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we could talk for hours about this, but yeah. thank you. But what I also want to talk to about is where you come from, <laughs> and you're from Louisiana, and you're sitting in front of the flag of Louisiana, uh, which I understand represents union, justice, and confidence. And I would love if you could take a moment to tell people what is special about Louisiana, New Orleans, and the people. Well, it's such a wonderful place. I was born in the city of New Orleans, and of course, New Orleans has such an important role in our nation's history. You know, you can go back to the Louisiana Purchase yeah. in 1803. President Thomas Jefferson wanted to get access to the port of New Orleans. You know how important that was to to open up trade with the rest of the world. If we were going to grow as a nation, we had to have the ability to get our, our products out to world markets. And the port of New Orleans was key. And, you know, France, it was all under French territory. And, you know, of course, we still have the French Quarter today in, in New Orleans. And, and that heritage is still very rich. But, you know, he'd sent a detached to to France. And they not only came back with a proposal to buy New Orleans, but to buy the whole Louisiana territory, literally doubling the size of our nation for $15 million. Still probably one of the best land deals in the history of the world. <laughs> best real estate deal. Uh, so, you know, you, you, you saw, you know, New Orleans and the role that New Orleans and Louisiana played uh, be a part of helping double the size of the country at the time, you know, led to the Lewis and Clark expedition to open up the West eventually. So, you know, I... I been there all my life, lived in the city and in parts. I went to LSU and so lived in Baton Rouge too and served in the state legislature. But, you know, we have such such strong people. We've been through a lot, you know, hurricanes, other things, you know, other people have been through tough times. Our people are very resilient. They're very creative. We've 
contributed a lot to the world. Zydeco music, jazz music came out of New Orleans. Some of these great musicians like Fats Domino, but also the food. You know, you go back to Paul Prudhomme creating these great spices and seasonings that everybody uses today. You know, what they call Cajun cooking. You know, it, it started with those great South Louisiana style creativity and cooks. And we've contributed a lot and we, we're very proud of our traditions. I love that. And when you were growing up, what was your youth like? <laughs> it was a great youth. I mean, I, I grew up in the suburbs of New Orleans. You know, I was about three years old. My parents moved out of the city of New Orleans into the suburbs. And that's when suburbs were growing in the 1960s and 70s. And we had a lot of fun. We had friends that were all around us. So, you know, so a lot of our, our parents' friends moved out to the same suburbs. So, you know, we'd go play sports, whatever the sport was, football season. We'd be playing football on a playground on the weekends or basketball and just kind of pick up games or baseball. Yeah. So, you know, it was, it was that kind of youth. And, you know, we, I still have some of those same friends to this day, you know, and, and ultimately when I, when I went off to school, went to Baton Rouge to go to LSU, you know, made great friends, got a great education in computer science, you know, worked for a software company. I was able to stay in New Orleans, you know, and just love having my family there still. LSU is very important to you. You know, I, I did purple <laughs> gold and I I, uh, I went and, and just loved my experience there. I actually lived in Tiger Stadium my second year. It used to be dormitories. So, you know, the, the stadium itself, the football stadium yeah. was built in the shape of dormitories and we actually lived there. And awesome. so I, uh, I used, I lived there my second year and, and loved that experience too. Now, going back a minute, I understand that when you, this is a story I read, that when you were a little boy, you decorated your bicycle in red, white, and blue and rode it around town so you would encourage people to vote. Is that true? You know, my sister outed me on that story. It, it is true. And um, she still has a picture of that bicycle. And I think I wore like an Uncle Sam hat in the picture, you know, and I might've been like 12 years old. It was just one of those things, you know, you, you, you just, I had a paper route at the time. So I'd, you know, drive around the neighborhood throwing papers to the, you know, the families on the paper out. And for whatever reason, when, when the election day would come, I would just go around the neighborhood and encourage people to vote. It was, you know, and this is around 1976 when we had the 200th anniversary of the United States. It was a great celebration of America. And so, you know, there's a lot of pride that I had in the country and, you know, the country celebrated that heritage too. And, you know, and so it was a special time. There were a lot of buildups to 1976. And I think it was probably around that time that I you know, I was doing that. I think it's a great story. And it's a beautiful story. It's, it you know, it's... a kid in New Orleans who understood that it was important to, you know, share what the beauty of our country. Yeah. You yeah. know, and I was fortunate to have parents who, who really taught me those values and, yeah. and believed it. You know, they, they, they let us all kind of do the things we enjoyed doing and gave us the guidance we needed to to stay on track. But uh, great youth growing up. And I have a question I ask everybody, which is, did you have a teacher that in high school, in elementary school, or in college, one teacher that really stands out as somebody that stood up for you, inspired you? You know, I had a few. And, you know, you go back to probably middle school. John Quincy Adams, by the way, you know, named after the president, was my middle school. It's still there, still standing as a middle school in, in Jefferson Parish. I had a teacher at Miss Gould. She taught social studies and you know, she just had a great way of teaching where you got excited. You wanted to go to the next class. Like, you know, you know, that, that to me, it shows you that, that some teachers really can make an impact above and beyond just the material where you want to go back. And, you know, my, my first professor that I probably felt that way about at LSU was, was Dr. Wayne Parent. And, and he taught Louisiana politics. I mean, you're talking about a rich and colorful history. Louisiana has got a very colorful history of, of politics and politicians, Huey Long, of course, so many others. And so uh, Wayne is actually now the head of the political science department, but I, uh, I got a major in computer science, but I got a minor in political science. And so I got to take courses from people like James Carville, who, you know, great Democrat political strategist. He and I have gotten to know each other well. And it was a fun time where you you could go, you could learn a lot. And I'd have arguments with my teachers. You know, we Reagan was president back then, and some of my professors weren't necessarily Reagan fans. I was. And so uh, we'd have fun, spirited differences. But you know, you as long as you knew your, you know, your topics, you know, it taught you to to study. You better know what you're talking about if you want to debate your professor. But if you're able to make your points, 
they respected that too. It was, it was a different day than some of the things you hear in colleges today, yeah. but I, I enjoyed it. And, and again, benefited from some of those great teachers that got you excited about going to class, not just, you know, to do well on the test, but to, to learn, to actually go in the classroom, learn from somebody that made it exciting. Yeah. And I like the idea that you could have arguments as long as they were civil and that you could respect. And at the end of the time, that's something that is what you're supposed to go to college for. Yeah. I believe. And I still have that belief today. I mean, I work in a place here at the Capitol. You know, yeah. we we don't all agree with each other. Republicans don't all agree with each other. And surely between Republicans and Democrats, but you never make those differences personal. Right. You know, it should never be violence or, you know, or vitriol. Right. You know, disagree on issues, state your case, try to persuade people, by the way. You know, the the old art of persuasion, I think, is still alive and well. And there are people that you can reach if you just explain what you believe in the right way with passion and and, and facts. You have a chance of bringing people over to your side. And if you're yelling and screaming at them, you're sure not going to get them to even pay attention to what you have to say. So, you know, I still think that that holds true in this job. Yeah, I love that. You also balance between here and home. And you have a wife who I'm sure is very, very strong and very, very powerful because yes. she can. <laughs> and, and you have two kids. How do you balance it because of all your travel? Yeah, and this is where my wife, Jennifer, really plays an important role. You know, when I was the majority whip, she, we called her affectionately the house whip. She was the whip <laughs> of our house because she kept everybody in line. And she still does, by the way. And, you know, we, we still have young kids or they're 17 and 15 and they're fun ages. And we, you know, she early off when I got elected to Congress, my daughter was one and a half years old. My son wasn't even born. So, you know, she knew, you know, we got to establish and figure out how to, how to balance a job where I'm on the road. Right. You know, I, we didn't move the family in DC. So I get on a plane and fly up to DC for three nights and fly back home. And that when I'm home, you know, especially on weekends, that is family time. We reserve that. We are, we're not doing political events. You could literally spend 24 hours a day, seven days a week doing this job. And it's an important job with a lot of responsibilities, but you can't let it consume your life. You, you know, we also have, you know, family that, that you don't want to miss the important things. And, and I miss a lot of things being up here, but when I'm home on the weekends, I'm with the family and we, you know, we'll, we'll do things they want to do. And it, it, it really has helped to truly balance it where, you know, I get to be a part of their lives and, and I'm not just checking emails all day when I'm around them. That's important. I also want to ask you a little bit about your faith and your resilience, because you are a very resilient person in addition to being a resilient leader. I mean, you've battled cancer, you were a victim of gun violence, and you just keep going. What is it that gave you this? Where, where does uh, it come from? Well, it's a big question, but... You know, look, I have a strong faith, and, and I think God gives you the strength, and I've leaned on him a lot. I, you know, I especially before the shooting, I already had strong faith in God, and, and I prayed every night, and you know, you... My view has always been, you don't just ask him for things, you know, hey, I want to do well on this test or I want this election to go well. You know, you shouldn't just talk to God when you want something. It should be a relationship where you're always talking about what's good and bad and, you know, thank him for things that happen good in your life, which by the way, way outweighs the bad things or the things you want. And it, and it reminds you that, you know, most things are, are positive and God does produce so many good things in our life. But, you know, the day I was shot, I mean, it, it was, it could have gone the other way very easily. I could not have made it through that day. And in fact, the odds were stacked against me making it out alive, but I was there. And I think there were miracles performed on that baseball field to allow me to make it through, you know, and I still, to this day, when I was diagnosed with cancer, again, put it in God's hands and just said, look, sure you have a plan and just ask for your guidance. And, you know, he brings you doctors and, you know, everybody says, well, you know, I'm waiting for a sign, you know, well, God's sending you a lot of signs. If he's sending yeah. people to help you and people that are praying for you, take the prayers. I feel the prayers when strangers even pray for you, but, you know, they also send doctors and other people that can help you through tough times too. And, you know, make sure you're, you're making the best use of that. Thank you for sharing that. What is going now to similar, but like different now, what is the best advice you've ever received? What is the worst advice you've ever received? And what is the advice you would give to people, young people specifically? Yeah, you know, really in terms of advice, it's an accumulation because I've done a lot of, of things in my life where I've been very fortunate to be in the right place at the right time, but also, you know, some things where you had to fight uphill to get there. And in every one of them, you know, you'll always have people that might try to detract and you know, if there's any bad advice, it's the people that tell you not to do something. 
you know, if there's something you really want to do, go for it. Right. And, 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 you know, if it's, if it's not the right thing to do, you need to make an educated decision. You know, don't put yourself and your friends and your family in a position where you know you're going to fail. But if there's something you want to go for, you just go for it. But the real key and the most important thing, and, and this comes up in so many different ways that people will give you advice, you got to work for it. You've got to put in the work. And anybody you talk to, I've gotten to meet so many amazing people that have done wonderful things. What every one of them tells you, whether they're successful at business, whether they're successful in the arts, or they just created something that that everybody knows and uses, they all worked their tail off. They didn't have anything given to them. It was something that they might have had good luck along the way. But again, it's the old saying, you know, the harder I work, the luckier I get. They would have never gotten those things if they weren't in a position because they had worked hard and done the things that you need to do when nobody's watching. Right. And, and that's where a lot of people fall short as they think, ah, you know, I don't have to put in the hard work today. Maybe when, you know, when everybody's around or when my parents are paying attention, that's when I can do my homework. That's not when you need to be doing it. It's when it's a Saturday and, you know, your friends are out playing and you still have something to do. You got to know, I've got to go do that work. Nobody else is going to do it for me. And and as long as you put in the hard work, you, anything's possible. And it truly holds still to this day in America. It's one of the great things about this country is if you work hard for something and you have a drive and a passion, you, you will find people that believe in you. Yeah. You know, people will will gravitate towards somebody who's got a passion and is working towards something real because there's still a hunger for that in America, but you've got to put in the work. I couldn't have said it better. Yeah, exactly. And it's not words of advice, but it's a philosophy. It's a philosophy. And it, it puts the burden back on you, but it's it's in a way where you know you can, do you really want this? And, and maybe it's something you don't really want. Yeah. You know, I've been in charge of recruiting people to run for Congress, for example, there's some people that you sit down with and you could tell after a few minutes, they don't really want this job or right. they don't want to do what it takes to but get this like job. But they like the title? They might like the title, but they're not going to put in. If you're not going to put in the time, you're doing a disservice to everybody. Yeah. If you're going to ask somebody that's close to you to give you a few thousand dollars of their hard-earned money, and then you're not really going to go out and do the work, you're not going to win. You're not really going to do the job effectively. But if you've got a fire in the belly, people will see it, they'll feel it, and they'll gravitate towards it. Yeah, I like that. So now I'm going to ask you just a handful of, a couple handfuls of rapid questions so people can just get to know who Steve Scalise is. Feel free to answer them how you choose a word or a sentence, however. What is your favorite sound? Zydeco music. Okay. Just fun. Fun music. It's what you grew up with. Yeah. Yeah. What is your favorite color? Blue. Favorite smell? Coffee in the morning. That's a good one. And who is your biggest cheerleader? My mom was my biggest cheerleader. She's no longer with me, but she's still like my guardian angel. I, I just think about her all the time. Favorite ice cream flavor? <laughs> I'm a raspberry or mango sorbet. And if you were to go with that, if you had one meal that you could choose, which is your ideal oh meal, what would it be? Gosh, I'm from New Orleans. I know. And charbroiled oysters with black and red fish. How about that? Wow. That one that I've be never heard meal. before. That <laughs> sounds pretty good. And... I kind of know what your favorite music is. And I like all, all forms of rock, rock, especially, but Zydeco music to me is just, it's a great cultural music from South Louisiana, but anybody in the world who listens to it, it's just fun music. It's rooted in uh, fun, you know, you got the washboard and a accordion and, you know, sometimes you got a violin. I mean, it's just great music. What is your favorite sport? Baseball. Did you ever dream to be a baseball player? I'm just curious as a kid. <laughs> I didn't really pick up the sport till till later in life. If, if I was this much of a fan of baseball when I was a young kid, I probably could have made the major leagues. <laughs> yeah, I do understand that this year the Republicans did beat the Democrats in the game. 31 to 10 in case anybody's Yeah, in case score. anyone's keeping <laughs> score. If you had to do a household chore, what would your favorite one be? Oh my gosh. You know, I... I still, you know, could mow the lawn. You know, I used to do that when I was a kid and made a little extra money doing it. Okay. And do you have a superpower? Do you think there's something that Steve Scalise has a superpower? Uh, you know, look, I'm like a cat with nine lives. I've, I've yeah. made it through a lot of uh, a lot of things that, you know, I've defied gravity on. So I, uh, I'll take where I am right now. I am lucky to be alive. I like that. This is my last question. And I've asked everybody, and I love the answers. What does joy mean to you? What brings you joy and how do you share your joy? Oh my gosh. Uh, you know, just sitting at home watching a movie with my family, you know, my wife and kids, that's joy. You know, you come home from a long week in DC, you know, it's a Friday night, put on a movie, eating some popcorn. It's about as good as it gets probably. Do you believe it as I do that if you are joyful and you share, you can share it and it really does share, it does spread to others. 
Oh, I think it's contagious. You know, attitude is contagious. You know, you go, you go to any event, if you're at a party, if you're out with friends, if somebody is down and they're just, they'll drag everybody down if you let them. But if somebody's really excited and they're up and they just, you know, they're people that are going to, you know, have a positive attitude and it's a choice, by the way, you know, we wake up every day and we can decide, are we going to have a good day or a bad day? Cause you could focus on, gee whiz, look at all the traffic. Well, you're about to get to your destination. You're not going to have to worry about that. You're going to be doing what you want to do. It's up to you to have the right attitude to say, this could be a great day. I'm going to have a good mood about what's happening. And if something bad happens, it's not because there's some conspiracy against me. It's just the way life is. Life's going to throw curveballs at you. You know, go swing at it, knock it out the park and move on to the next one. I'm going to end on that. Swing at it, go for it, work hard. And I want to thank you because first, I've really gotten to learn about who you are as a person and about your state, Louisiana, about your family, but just about your values. And I really appreciate them. And thank you for giving me this opportunity and for others to be able to learn a little bit more about who you are as a person. So thank you so much. Oh, thank you for wanting to dig in so deep. It's uh, it's really great to have you here. Thank you. Hi, it's Liz. Please join me every Tuesday for coffee to talk about heart and humanity with our elected leaders. Remember to hit subscribe to get an alert when a new episode is live and for exclusive content. Ciao.